whether that's running, biking, cycling, uh, you could be rowing. Uh, lately here, we've been doing a lot of combat sports a couple times a week. Whatever it is, get your ass sweating. Working out also gives me a mental boost. It gives me a lot of clarity. For example, when I get out of a good role, I feel grounded. I feel centered. I don't feel lost in my thoughts. I feel very into my body. And that actually gives me that mental sharpness and I actually have a more productive day. Oh, I gotta day. go. I've been working, told them please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan, they can't eat. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Cup of News podcast with your host, Matt, and myself, Peter. But first, some brief announcements. Make sure you guys check out the Cup of Nurses.com, our website. We have all our show notes there. Everything that we talk about in these episodes, all the data that we provide is on there. Awesome pieces of content, awesome show notes. We also got some blog posts. Don't forget to check out the Cup of Nurses.shop with all our latest merch. And also, we have we are for warriors.com. Lots of interesting stuff there. Also, shop available. And thank you for our listeners on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all the podcast platforms. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. We release all these episodes on the video every Monday, every Friday. And we also got the vlog going uh, bi weekly. So don't forget to tune into that. What's up, Matt? Doing pretty well. On today's episode, we're going to talk about longevity, the diet, and the exercise that you need in order to op optimize your lifespan. Good stuff. Interesting stuff today. I love doing doing these news because, like, I learned so much on these news episodes. I know, like, in the past, I would try to kind of script the episodes based on what I know, and now I'm trying to like script about things that I, I don't know. Some of the stuff, some of the things that we talk about, we don't always agree with, but it's always uh, good content. It's always good thing, good thing to look at it from like a different perspective. Yeah, and I think this is a good episode because as we you know we talked about different episodes that our lifespan is decreasing, is declining in America. Mm -hmm. So this is the best way to optimize yourself to increase your lifespan and live as long as possible. It's interesting too because diet is a number one thing you can do for yourself to increase your lifespan and exercise is number two. Yeah, a lot of people compensate for their diet or the lack of a good diet with exercise and that's not something they should try to do. A lot of people, you could say at the gym that you see there for months and months and, and their body doesn't change, it's because they're putting a giant emphasis on exercise but not enough emphasis on, on diet because diet is something that you consume multiple times a day and exercise, you do exercise maybe multiple, multiple times a week. So if you think about it, diet is a lot more important than your exercise regimen. And usually what happens is people that exercise, they say, well, I did one hour cardio, now I deserve this snack. Mm -hmm. But little, little that we know is that is detrimental to our health. And the first thing we're going to talk about is exercise because movement is the fundamental part of life. Without movement, nothing will exist. Our bodies will not exist. If your blood is not moving oxygen, you're not going to be able to oxygenate. If your lungs aren't expanding and breathing in oxygen, how, how, are, your, how are your cells going to have oxygen? If your heart is not pumping, how is oxygen going to go, get to that cell? So everything is vital. If your spine... You know, and the same thing comes into diet. If you're not consuming these proper micronutrients, how is your body supposed to absorb and function properly? 100%. Even if when you're taking a hospital, hospital perspective about this, when you get hip surgery, knee surgery, cardiac surgery, they want you out of bed as soon as possible because as physicians and nurses, medical professionals, we know how important it is to move. If you don't move it, you lose it. Same way you look at our bedbound patients, people that have been in ICU for five days, six days, weeks, months, it's very hard for them to regain their mobility because you're not using it. And it just shows you how important it is. And your body is meant to move. As humans, we travel, we move around, and that's our natural environment. Our natural environment isn't to, to stay seated, right? We're not, we're not those kind of beings. That's why we see like this giant, giant spike in back problems and obesity because a lot of our jobs now 
our desk jobs and we're not moving. So our body isn't getting properly fulfilled in a movement aspect. Yeah, even if you look at the world and the way it's expanding, it's always growing. The universe is always expanding. We're always meant to be changing. Mm -hmm. Even like in life, for example, growth, for example, right? If you get comfortable in your um, comfort zone, you... I feel like the universe or God, as you may, always kind of gives you things and ways to kind of push yourself. And if you don't, you're hitting these roadblocks, you're unhappy because life is always meant to be expanding. You're always meant to be growing and different and changing from you were last year. And even from just like we all mentioned, the facts here from a purely biological level, we're meant to always be evolving. Yeah, down to the car, down to the atoms. Like even if you remember, I think it's is it chemistry class or maybe physics, like if you have uh, an, an atom or whatever, you have the neutron in the middle and the electron spins around the neutron right and the protons so even we're moving on, on that small level so that just shows you how important that is yeah and and also the quantum level so and we're going to talk about longevity i think it's really important to hit the blue zones and in order to understand this we look at sanitarians and sanitarians are people that have lived mostly up to a century so blue zones are small pockets of population in different parts of the world that have sanitarians and you know we, we want to study why they have been living so long mm -hmm. so some spots that are considered blue zones are okinawa in japan sardina in italy nicoya in costa rica and ikaria in greece mm -hmm. so there was a doctor which is a little bit different from dr walter longo that we're going to talk about and some of the characteristics that are inhabiting these blue zones, these people tend to have moderate to regular physical activity. They have a life purpose. They have stress reduction abilities. They have moderate caloric dot intake, I should say. Mm. Uh, mostly plant-based diet. Uh, moderate alcohol intake, especially wine. And this is more from Sardina, Italy. Like the people that are, are drinking a glass of wine daily, always with their dinners. Uh, they're engaged in spiritual or religious activities. They have engagement in both family and social life. And they're also close to the equator. I just looked it up right now. So that probably plays a role on their vitamin D intake as well, yeah. which is which is pretty interesting, interesting to note. But it's Dr. Walter Longo that came to these conclusions. And Dr. Longo, he is a longevity expert in the University of Southern California in LA. And he has more than 30 years of experience working with with longevity and lifestyle and, and lifespan. So this guy's very knowledgeable. And it's cool because the first thing that he recommends is walking fast for an hour a day. And that's the one thing that we always preach to people is if you live a sedentary lifestyle, if you don't exercise as much as you, you, you should or if it's hard for you to exercise, it's always good to start with, with, a, with a walk. He's preaching walk fast for an hour, but obviously you wanna start somewhere. And we always say, if you're new to exercise, new to movement, try to at least walk an hour a day. And it just shows you how, how important that is. And it just shows you that, hey, sometimes we know what we're talking about, you know? Yeah. I've, I feel like I've lost it in Chicago just trying to get the hour a day because most of the work that we're doing on the computer about podcasting or building websites is I'm sitting on my damn computer so much. I'm driving to the gym, driving to my parents' house. So I try to do it sometimes first thing in the morning if I can. I'll go for a walk around the block and get that in. Uh, this is a little bit different from cardiovascular exercise to get plenty of that, but mostly walking. So if you can do little things like if you pick up coffee and if you have time in the morning, maybe it's only 10 minutes away, you want to get in your first quarter of the hour of uh, cardio or walking, I should say, go to the coffee shop, try to implement different techniques in your day where you can walk more. Yeah, 100%. And it's just, it's so simple. Like instead of driving a car for five minutes or two minutes, just, just make that walk. Like even we started walking in California, we we walked to like the nearby stores, like the some of the shops, um, you know, the little tobacco stores if we need like a lighter for something or some matches or something like that. We we just walked there instead of driving. Yeah, it's more convenient to drive the car, you know, for two minutes. But the walking did it did us a better benefit. A lot of times it will make us you know feel a lot better, especially if we did like a leg day or like a back day, or we just sat for a long period of time. It's like a nice stretch because when you're walking, you're also stretching out your legs. You're not just you know, walking for the, for the, you could say cardiovascular benefits or whatever you want to consider them. Yeah. In California, we're at, um, California, psych, we're mm -hmm. actually going to Texas, uh, but we're only going to have one car. So I feel like that's going to interfere with 
less driving and more walking because uh, we looked up the area. Everything's fairly close as far as grocery stores and all the necessities. Mm -hmm. So we're probably going to be walking a lot more or maybe taking a bike instead of driving because we're only going to have one car for three people. Yeah. If you really want to incorporate walking into your routine, the easiest probably way for you to do it is, is at night. Like go for like a nightly walk, like at nine o'clock or eight o'clock, a little, a little bit before bed because that's going to be like your time to wind down. You kind of reflect on the day. You can maybe go on a walk with a spouse, walk your dog, things like that. You don't have to always do it in the morning or throughout the day. You could do it as like a, a wind down kind of thing. 100%. Mm -hmm. So the second thing that Dr. Lango recommends is to do cardiovascular exercise 2.5 to 5 hours a week. Uh, the key thing is getting your heart rate up. The American Heart Association recommends to hit 50 to 85 percent of your maximal heart rate. If you want to do that, uh, you do 220 minus your current age, and that's your maximal heart rate. And you want to, uh, like I said, hit 50 to 85 percent. You want to get a sweat in, whether that's running, biking, cycling. Uh, you could be rowing. Uh, lately here, we've been doing a lot of combat sports a couple times a week. Whatever it is, get your ass sweating. And I think the easiest place to start with this is doing stairs. Because you can just walk upstairs. You don't have to do it very fast, and you're already tired. Like, I remember there's been times where I didn't feel like waiting for the elevator, and, and like, I took the stairs in my, one of my prior jobs. And, like, I went up the stairs, my heart rate was, was up, and I was already sweating. You know, so you don't have to necessarily do it fast. It's just something to get your heart rate up, you know, because some of us sweat easier than others. Like I, like I sweat, like I'm sitting here and I'm sweating, you know, you, you probably not, but I sweat very easily. So if I kind of gauged exercise in, in strenuous, strenuous wise, based on sweat versus heart rate, my heart rate has to go up very high for me to start sweating. So easy way to start just doing steps because steps are a lot harder than, than you think. And they're available literally everywhere. Yeah. We would have to read the book, but I wonder what's the difference that Dr. Longo recommends because maybe I don't walk an hour a day. Maybe I don't even realize it, but I do a lot more cardiovascular exercise as far as working out uh, three days a week and I do jujitsu four days a week. So what's the balance there? Do you need to fundamentally be walking because movement is the basis of life? Like I know like the um, lymphatic system uses movement to push nutrients and the whole muscles across our whole entire body. Yeah, movement's very important. Like, like imagine if you didn't move as much as you did, your, I feel like your body would naturally deteriorate. It would almost feel useless as a way. And you mentioned walking. We do a lot of walk in hospital, like a lot. We just didn't think about that right now because we haven't been in a hospital for a minute. But on a, on a normal- 12 hour shift. Right, on, on a normal travel nursing you know, contract, walking, we're doing a lot of it. So now it's not so much, but we do have an increase in probably cardiovascular activity because we're working out more than we would on like a, a contract, right? Yeah, very good point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we do these uh, work at shift, I'll get up at least like 6,000, oh, yeah. 7,000. It's not as much when I worked med surge, of course, because my patients are closer and usually door to door, but I still get my steps in. Yeah, the next one here is he recommends using weight training or weight free exercises to strengthen the muscles and once again, man, I talk about this a lot. He mentions a, a large study in, our, in a large Australian study from 2015 with over 200,000 participants aged 45 to 75 found that those who exercised at least 2.5 hours per week had a 47% reduction in overall mortality going up to five hours per week led to a 54% reduction in mortality. And that's using straight training based exercises. Yeah. And sometimes people struggle losing weight by doing a lot of cardio workouts if they incorporate weightlifting into their into their regimen, it increases their cardiac expenditure by a whole lot because people aren't used to resistance and weight training exercises. And plus, it tones your body. Yeah, you know, the elliptical or the treadmill might help you burn calories, but the weightlifting is going to get you more in like a nicer physique, you could say. Yeah, plus like we have 600 different types of muscles in the human body, which consumes 40% of our total body weight. Mm -hmm. It's super important to have muscular strength for coordination, movement, balance. And, you know, we have a pandemic, I would say, of osteoporosis in the hospital. Their orthopedic surgeons are booming. You know, older ladies are always mm -hmm. breaking something or guys, and they're so fragile. It's really important to maintain that uh, bone density. And, and strength training is one of those ways to 
maintain bone density for a long period of time. If you really want to change your body, try to incorporate cardiovascular exercise and, and weight training. Like it's it's amazing what that could do because not only burning fat, but you're also putting on muscle. And a lot of us go to the gym to look good. That's going to definitely uh, benefit you in, in, in that way. A lot of working out and stuff is definitely mental, but you know, it's like 50-50, half mental, half good, or sorry, half mental, half physical, because one of the major driving factors for, for the gym, for even us, probably is, is, is physique. You know, you want to look good. And, and it shows that, hey, like if you go to the gym co- consistently, like it shows on your body. Your, your body resembles your, your consistent nature in, in the gym. And that makes you more appealing to, to people because it shows you, that you hey, you could commit to something that's that's hard. Right. And it's like people have a disconnect. If you're, because there's two types of suffering in the world. There's suffering physically and mentally. And usually that people are overweight and I'm stereotyping here. Sorry, guys. But people that are overweight usually have a disconnect between their mind and their body where they're suffering. They want to look good, but somehow they're, they have a drive from their body subconscious that wants to eat bad. And then they have like this guilt, shaming and all this stuff, Mm -hmm. you know? So yes, physique is important, but also the way that person takes care of himself, the way that person feels about himself really tells by the body. It really is a good indicator. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gym is, I feel like is super important because you literally are seeing the results. You, you're, you're mentally, you know that you put a month of hard effort into this and your body compensates you by physically showing you that one month of, of exercise that, that you put in. It's literally like an, like an exam. It's like a, like a checks and balances system. Mentally, you're telling yourself you could do it and, you, and then you're literally seeing the, the results on you, which is the beauty of it. So it's improving you mentally and improving you physically. Yeah, f- physical activity and going to the gym was one of like those first steps where... Life-changing. I, yeah, and I started putting goals for myself. I started saying, okay, I want to lift this much weight or bench, squat, deadlift, whatever case might be. And then you hit those goals and you feel rewarded because you know that building muscle physique is a long-term play. You have delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. So not only does it feel good on a physical level, now you can apply that technique, that grit, that perseverance to different parts of your life. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would also say that working out also gives me a mental boost. It gives me a lot of clarity. For example, when I get out of a good role, I feel grounded. I feel centered. I don't feel lost in my thoughts. I feel very into my body. And that actually gives me that mental sharpness and I actually have a more productive day. A lot of times people say, oh, you know, people that, that weight lift, they go to the gym and they, they work out. They're very egotistic. But no, like like you said, sometimes the, the gym, especially combat sports, grounds you because, yeah, you might look good. But at the gym, there's always somebody that looks better, right? Same way when you roll, there's, you might be better than some people, but there's always going to be somebody, somebody better than you. So it's always, hum- so it's also humbling. Yes. People say, oh yeah, yeah. People are, you know, that are real cut, real in shape are, are very egotistic. I mean, no, not, majority of them are not. They're not because, because they, they know what they work for and they know that somebody out there is working harder than them. Right. I'm not going to lie. The gym that I go to here in Chicago, there's a bunch of tool bags and you can tell people walk around with a huge ass mm-hmm. ego um, I even myself unlearned all those uh, bad subconscious programmings of comparison and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting because I've been working out for over a decade. So it's interesting seeing how I uh, evolved myself. For example, maybe when I was younger, I was working out as hard as I can to look good because maybe I was compensating for something as like a lack of confidence mm-hmm. or whatever, whatever it is. And therefore, I had that front that ego but now i've learned how to dissolve that through uh, my self-awareness journey and now it's just interesting looking back at the gym and sometimes people watching and seeing how people behave in the behavior that i used to partake in yeah the gym is an interesting environment it's it's really cool and you meet a lot of people there you know you might meet somebody that might be like a really good friend in the future and people always always give advice tips like i know when i go to the the sauna after my workout like there's like a dude or two in there like we're always talking shit It's, it's just like a it's like, it's like, I guess you could say on a healthy es- escape almost because you're still working on yourself, even though you're not doing the normal things in society that you would be doing. Kind yeah. Of thing. Mm. So the next thing is the best diet for longevity and Dr. What's his name here? Longo? I just blanked out. Dr. Longo. He wrote a book called 
the longevity diet, discover the new science behind stem cell activation and regeneration to slow aging, fight disease, and optimize weight. So we're going to go over some points that he mentions in the book that are highly recommended for longevity that he realized study, studying longevity and being and doing research in these blue zones. Mm -hmm. So one of them is to mostly eat vegan plus a little bit of fish. So it's interesting because when I've talked to my grandparents and my family members, meat wasn't around like it, it is now. Uh, back in the communist time in Poland, they used to have a, pe a card where you only got like two kilos of meat uh, a month. Mm. If you bought two kilos of sausage, you can't get two kilos of red meat. You were limited. So our family members ate a lot of potatoes. They used dairies, cheese, cows, and stuff like that. That's how they were raised. Mm. And now we have a huge consumption of meat. Um, so the goal here is to limit red meats, eat mostly vegan, and he recommends to eat fish two to three times per week. When you're going to choose fish, of course, be careful for mercury levels. So you want to eat um, crab, lobster, shrimp, uh, maybe some mollusks, which is oyster, squid, uh, scallops as well, which have high omega-3s, omega-6s, B12s, and uh, contents from salmon, anchovies, which I have never ate or found <laughs> around sardines, cod, trout, clams, and shrimp. And also pay attention to the, the quality of the seafood, where you're getting it from. Make sure it's it's uh, grown or raised in a, in a good environment because you might be thinking, oh, I'm eating a lot of this this fish. It's healthy for me. But farm farm raised fish, you know, could have, like my said, could have high mercury levels or different kind of nutritional imbalances that you might think are, benef are, are benefiting you, but they're actually not because you're eating too much of, of like a, an animal that's been unhappy, you could say, or not raised properly. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing that, that we have in the show notes is he recommends that if you are below the age of 65, keep protein intake low. So he's saying 40 to 47 grams of protein per day for a person weighing 130 and 60 to 70 grams of protein per day for someone that's weighing 200 to 220. And then after the age of 65, you should slightly increase protein by increasing consumption of fish, eggs, white meat, and goat meat and, and, and sheep meat, which is very interesting because a lot of these dietitians and people that that work with, like in the diet field, they recommend a high intake of protein. One gram per body part usually, mm -hmm. if, if not 1.5 mm -hmm. sometimes. Interesting. And I recommend that to people to people as well. And that's probably what I eat too. I've majority of my diet consists of protein and I try to eat as little carbs as possible, which is which is really, really interesting. Yeah, when I eat a... 12 ounce piece of grass fed steak that's up to like 60 to 80 grams of protein mm -hmm. already. So I'm already over almost over consuming in one meal for myself. Yeah. But I'm kind of curious on how, because this is the diet of the people that are in these blue zones, right? I wonder how much of, of like a impact the environment has on them. That's just the food because maybe they just have a really good, outside external environment and a really good lifestyle where the diet kind of accommodates that versus like the lifestyle that we have here, a different diet would accommodate that. So, so what I'm saying is, what if you take this diet, put it in a different environment, different stresses, how is it going to impact the person, right? Yeah. Because that, that plays a role too, you know, because like I feel really good when I, when I eat keto, when I decrease the protein, especially when I limit my, my, my bread and stuff. And pasta intake, like I, I feel great, but which is interesting. But he's saying that if you want to live longer, you want to have like a higher carb diet, higher um, higher fats and less protein, which is very interesting. It's almost like like um, the opposite of what I, what I've what I've been told to do and what I've learned. Yeah, I don't think I ever had a diet where I had a huge carb intake and a low protein intake, and I always had FOMO for muscle building, where I don't want to consume so much carbs and eat more protein because hey i want to grow my muscles muscles mm -hmm. muscles amino acids that's important where carbs are fat you know kind of stuff carbs turn into fat if you have too much carbs you're gonna you know get those love handles yeah and also i feel like here in western society we have a bad representation of carbs because of the ultra processed foods mm -hmm. so our carb sources are completely shitty versus the carb sources these people are eating pro are probably from whole foods mm -hmm. You know, and it's interesting even how our ancestors uh, did things. Uh, for example, 
Uh, they always, you know, they grinded their own wheat. They created bread out of it. Uh, they had cows, which had, you know, milk and cheese from that. They had chickens from eggs, you know. Uh, one interesting thing that my grandpa told me is um, when they killed the pig, uh, they used to put it into the, a wooden basin. So when you have like a giant tree trunk, you basically carve a hole in it mm -hmm. and you put the pig in there and you let it marinate for two weeks. And what happened like, is like a sauce or what? Like salt, pepper, maybe water, salt in the in the basin. Oh, just like 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 a marinated like meat when you smoke it, right? Yes. And what happened is that pig had a shelf life for up to six months without it being frozen. Mm -hmm. If you marinate it like that, yeah. which is interesting because I've never never thought about it that way. Well, when you look back, uh, remember like history class when people used to go on long voyages. That's why salt was so important. Was they used to just bask things in salt for longevity because it pulls out that moisture. So that's probably yeah. why. And then he also mentioned what you fed to the animal why it lasted so long so for mm -hmm. example uh they, they recycled everything for example they fed this pig potatoes they gave it poison ivy eggshells they gave it eggshells oats sometimes cabbage um you know your leftovers like all like remember when i remember poland was whatever you didn't use that came from like a like a plant or, or an animal you would just give it to the pig you want to throw it out like we do here, you would give it to the pig, and because pigs would eat anything, that's like the double-edged sword of a pig. Is that a pig will eat anything? So whatever you you feed the pig, it'll it'll it'll, it'll eat. So if it's a poor diet, it's going to eat that no matter what, because it's, it's a pig. That's why a lot of people say pork is a dirty animal because it'll eat anything. Yeah, it'll eat anything, but if you feed it the right things, it could still be very nu nutritious for you. Yeah, I think there's something beautiful about that life that we really don't know much about, where you're self-sustainable where you have this great relationship with nature and everything comes full circle meaning you know you're kind of praying and hoping the crops are good the weather is good and now the crops are feeding your animals your livestock it's feeding you it's used for different things uh, nothing ever goes to waste right mm -hmm. for example just like we said you fed everything to the pig sometimes you had bones you gave your dog stuff too. Like here, if you gave a raw bone or whatever it is from something to a dog, they would go crazy because it could choke or something. Yeah, Back then, you, or just, something. you just fed it everything. And it's crazy to think about that's how our ancestor did, did things. You know, even my grandpa told me when he used to eat the fat off this, you know, this, this pig, and it was different. He said it tasted different. If you ever had, in Polish, it's called smolets. If you ever had it, he said he went to the freaking uh, to the land to do work, and he was uh, not hungry all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dude. It's, uh, what is it called? A high? Uh, I don't think so. I was gonna say high glycemic index, but it's something different. Yeah, it's just like it's very calorie rich. Like you know, smarts is very calorie rich, and even here, some of my parents make like the smarts with like bacon inside, and they put on like a piece of bread. And I, I personally never tried it because like I always thought that was like you're just eating fat, which is gross. So I've I've never I've yet to taste it. But maybe I should try it, you know, in the future. Yeah, we just have a bad relationship with nature, which is leading to a lot of issues. And yeah, I'm just very fascinated by that lifestyle. I would want to learn more about it. That's why I, before I'm flying out to Texas, I keep hanging out with him and keep asking questions because I want to learn so much about that mm -hmm. lifestyle that we never learned about and that that's lost. Yeah. And a third point Dr. Longo stressed is to minimize saturated fats from animal and vegetable sources, which is meat and cheese, minimize sugar. And maximize good fats and complex carbs. So eat whole grains and high qualities of vegetables like tomatoes, broccoli, carrots, legumes, with generous amounts of olive oil. He says about three tablespoons per day and nuts. So you know through the nuts you get a good amount of protein and like this is th this this point I, I agree with. If you can maximize your your vegetables and like your whole foods, you could definitely do you could definitely make a good impact on your on your body. Yeah, it's just one of those things again where he stresses. I can't get over that like you know. That, that that the high carb kind of thing, but complex carbs are gonna be like, like your fruits as well, right? Are, are fruits complex carbs? I forgot. Or are simple carbs? Then they're simple carbs. Why oh, are you asking me difficult questions right now, man? Um, look up real quick. I would say, yeah. Just let me know, man. I don't want to say stupid. I want to say they're simple carbs. So that's what I've been taught. The yeah. fourth point is to follow a diet that's high in vitamins and minerals. So Dr. Longo actually recommends using a multivitamin as a buffer every three days 100 100 because if you try to eat 
and get all your vitamins and minerals from your diet, it's really, really hard for you to get all of them, especially in, in a modern Western diet. So, you know, man, I always stress, get a multivitamin. You got to take it every day, but just take it on maybe more of your, on your busy days if you're not going to have enough time to, to eat certain foods. Yeah. Right. Okay. Something beautiful about the diet, man. <laughs> um, number five is to select ingredients that have been discussed in the book that the ancestors would have eaten. So those would be things, for example, eating organ meat sometimes, or a lot of our family members used to cook meats that were made off the bone. So when you make your soups, for example, chicken noodle soup or whatever, the kvashnitsa, I don't know what it's called in English. Uh, um, sauerkraut soup. Sauerkraut soup. What happens is when you cook this meat on the bone, it releases all the bone marrow and all like the um, amino acids, the glucosaminates, whatever they're called, that actually helps preserve um, healthy bone. Yeah, the bone marrow is so good. Like you don't have a lot of it, you know, but sometimes when you make like, like the, like you said, the meat off the bone, you get that bone marrow. And I always suck at the bone marrow because it's always so good to me. Yeah. But yeah, and you got the bone broth in there if you, if you toss it. And yeah, it, 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 very, very healthy and it's, and it's boiled. It's not fried. Like I always like meat from soup. Yeah, that's one thing I also want to learn is how to make organic bone broth. I used to buy it at Trader Joe's, but it's fairly expensive. Uh, it's only a f couple simple ingredients that you do, and it's healthy for uh, the immune system by, I think it coats the, the digestive tract. Mm -hmm. Whatever it does, the ingredients are in there and super healthy. Uh, another fun fact is uh, we should be eating a lot of fermented foods, which is healthy probiotics and stuff like that. Uh, back in the day, our ancestors, like Native Americans, when they killed the bison, they used to have pride in eating the guts because the bison had a, had a lot of grass and intestines which were fermented. So they would actually have pride in eating the guts with all those. You know, that's not something we would do now. It sounds nasty as hell. Yeah, those are things that they partook in. Hundred percent. Because I I was reading a book about the Comanche. And one of the, the luxurious foods was like the bile because they would use the bile as like a seasoning. That's when they would like maximize the, the taste. They would take the, the bile and the bile acids and they would put it over the cooked meat and they would eat it that way, which, yeah. which is crazy. You would never want to eat bile now. You know, if you tell somebody, hey, you want some, some bile, people think you're fucking crazy or something. You know? Yeah, this kind of reminds me of like my dad used to like make me sit behind a table and eat liver. Yeah. And I used to hate the damn thing. It used to taste so bad. I had to put more salt on it. You know, you try to put some onion because they made a grill onions with it. And it was just so hard to consume. But I appreciated what they wanted to teach me was eating right. Yeah, I was the same way. But liver has grown on me probably anything else. Because like right now, I love liver. I don't know if that's like, it, it tastes better as you age. I'm not sure how you feel about liver right now. But liver, I used to be the same. Like I would never eat it. It would look gross. It would like never be appetizing. But right now, to me, liver is, is so good. Same with like jawantki, so stomachs mm -hmm. and intestines. That, or um, where is that um, flatchki? So it's basically like uh, like intestines, it's intestines, all that stuff. It's like a soup form, a little bit of beef and stuff. Like that's like I love that now too. But I used to hate it when I was younger. Yeah, but yeah. now I can now I can literally eat it every day. It's so good. Uh, so, number. You have anything to say? No, I was gonna hit up point number five here or six. Uh, number six is an interesting one because. Uh, he's telling you how much meals you should have a day based on your circumference or your, or your weight. So if you're overweight or tend to gain weight easily, he says to consume two meals a day and with two low sugar snacks that have less than 100, 100 calories each. But if you're a normal weight and tend to be harder for you to, or if you tend to be normal weight and easier for you to lose weight, he recommends three meals with also with one snack, which is interesting because this is basically like fasting. He recommends fasting because yeah. he's also saying that if you're going to have your first meal at 8, have your last meal at at, at 8 p.m. If you're going to eat at 8 a.m., eat the last meal at 8 p.m. And then you should fast for the rest of that, which is very interesting because fasting, I feel like it's one thing that a lot of religions, a lot of dietitians, and a lot of people that are speak about longevity and, and health, I feel like they, they all all say that fasting is beneficial give it it's eight hours 12 14 16 which is something that i find i find very interesting and something that's that's trending and, and new to come to existence yeah so he recommends to at least have 12 on 12 off minimum mm -hmm. and it's cool because we've been fasting for so long and it's always worked out for me i always felt good and clearly your body needs a break in between right um I think there was another thing where it's uh, insulin levels, for example. If your insulin levels are always high, 
you're not going to be able to hit autophagy, which is that natural state of your body to clean itself out. Like we think our body doesn't regenerate, but it really does. If you take a little clip, if you take a little snip of your liver out, it's going to regenerate. Mm. Our body has these secret mechanisms, but we're always in a fed state, which prevents that from happening. Right. Each organ in our body needs a break. Our brain needs a break. We sleep. Our heart needs a break. Because imagine if your heart rate was always 120, 130, 140. You won't be able to survive, right? It needs that break. Same way your liver needs that break because you shouldn't always eat, drink alcohol all the time. Imagine if you, if you drink alcohol every day. It's called alcoholism, right? And then you go into liver ne necrosis and, and you could die. So your body needs these breaks. So why don't you give your one of the biggest organs in your body, your intestines and your gut, a break too, right? By, by fasting, complete. It, it makes a lot of sense if you, if you think about it in that way and taking breaks. Yeah, and then also I would add on to this point is just look up your BMI, look up your body mass circumference, see how your waist lines up. Uh, for example, I think for females, if your waist is larger than 35 inches, you're at r higher risk for heart disease and having a stroke and MI and all that. What about them wide hip females that are naturally gifted with those beautiful hips? Uh, so this was the... Not the hips, but the waist. Oh, the waist. The, the waist. waist, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hips, they could have an hourglass figure. You know, God is not judging them there. But if they got a bigger waist where it's, you know, I think it's 35, like I said. And for men, I believe it's 38 inches. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what my waist is, but I'm, I don't think I'm you know, fine. You're thin, you're thin, man. You need yeah, to I'm eat. Thin. Put some weight on there, bro. I'm, I'm trying, dude. It's Your hard. grandma would say, Piotrus, you're so skinny, man. Eat some damn meat. So I... I th I think in every Polish grandma's eyes, no matter how much you weigh, you're still not fat enough, dude. It, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Because I was a little, little, little puntush when I was little, little, you know, like a little, little fatty or whatever. I don't know how, what the hell the translation is into puntush to, to English. It's, it's like a, it's like a mini donut technically in <laughs> English, but it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you know, I was still never, ne never, never, you know, heavy enough for my grandma. You know, she always still gave me more food and stuff. So you got to watch out for those grandmas, you know? Yeah. Also, in the beginning of the episode, we mentioned um, like life purpose and stress mm. reduction, which was like uh, point number two and point number three when it comes to longevity. And I think that's also important, too, because mm. if you have a sense of belonging and you have a sense of you're doing something for the greater part of the world and you know how to cope with yourself, you feel good mentally. I think that has a, a great correlation with uh, longevity because the people that you always look like at the hospital when you're working as a nurse that are older and they're in good shape. Those guys are always smiling. They're mm -hmm. always like, you know, they're in the hospital, they're in bad shape, but they're always kind of cracking a joke. And you can tell they're always optimistic about mm -hmm. stuff. And I think that's also a great, you know, big factor in, in longevity. Man, I think we just made a breakthrough in health today. I think we just created a holy trinity of health, <laughs> diet, exercise, and lifestyle. Yep. Right. It makes complete sense. If you diet, could lifestyle, What's the exercise. Trinity? Exercise. The Holy Trinity of Health. The Health Trinity. We should pan that. We should write a book about that. <laughs> Coming out soon. Because think about it, right? If you eat good, if you exercise well, and you have a, a a good, healthy lifestyle, good mindset, what else do you really need in life? That's basically it, right? You should, you probably can live to 120. Yeah. And, if the, and if the government's telling you otherwise, I think they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what the wild thing is here is, you know, we talk about all these points for prevention medicine and living healthy and, you know, again, I don't want to talk about the pandemic, but none of these points were hit at all. Mm -hmm. The most important things for you to live healthy are not talked about. You know, and we need to be talking about them. That's why we're talking about That's them. That's what we're talking about, boss, man. The holy trinity of health. Yes. Right, you heard Let's go over to three here again. We're going to go with diet, exercise, lifestyle. You heard it here, folks. You heard it here first, folks. Should end up with that. Yes. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you guys. Hope you guys like these episodes. If you have any ideas for us to improve or topics or different things for us to podcast about, hit us up on Instagram or email us at info at Thank you for listening. See you guys next week. See you.